So anyway, uh, we're going to move to the second part of the program, which will be uh, Joe's discussion about all this absolutely wonderful equipment. I strongly suggest, you can do whatever you want, but I strongly suggest that you, you really move down for here. A lot of this second part, in fact, there's very little playing, and a lot of this second part is really the visual aspect of, the, of these treasures and how they've been restored and so on and so forth. So it's going to take us just a second to get set up. And as I say, you can do whatever you want, but in my humble opinion, you will be much better off down here and you'll get a lot more out of it. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for attending today. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. Of course, sharing with you um, some, of, some of my madness uh, with vintage drums. And uh, even though I've chosen a pretty broad range of uh, vintage drums from the late 1800s into the 40s, I assure you that I will be, of course, skipping some blocks of time because otherwise I'd be here for three, four hours and nobody really needs that. So. I'm going to, I uh, brought a bunch of live uh, examples of uh, instruments. Some are in their uh, original natural state of, of aged. Others are ones that I have completely uh, restored. It's, it's part of my thing as well as being a vintage drum restoration uh, and repair specialist through different uh, varieties of restoration. Some clients want them looking just like they did when they were made. Other clients would rather prefer to have them kind of in a relic state or uh, of such. So um, the reason why there's all these words here, J.W. Pepper, Zoisman, Excelsior, and uh, Trust Tension is because in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, there were drum manufacturers and drum distributors. So this first uh, drum, the truss tension drum, was also known as a J.W. Pepper. Well, J.W. Pepper out of Philadelphia was simply the distributor. Adolf Zoistman was the creator of it, designer of it, and he was the president of the Excelsior Drum Company that was in Camden, New Jersey, then eventually they moved to Philadelphia. So early on, it, it's just like any big company, you know, they seek out a smaller company that's doing well and they buy it up or offer them distribution of their product. So quite a few drums would look very similar and just have different names on them. Whoa. So this is the a very poor rendition of the, <laughs> the Excelsior interior tag which of the time period, they didn't have badges on the outside of the drum. All the identifiers were on the inside, and that came from the Civil War area, rope tension drums. A lot of time with rope tension, you can't tell the provenance and the value of them because everything that's important is written on the inside, and there were no vent holes then that you could just peer into. So a lot of times, if you didn't want to deal with disassembling a, a, uh, a rope tension drum, which could be madness, you really had no idea what was going on on the inside. Well, of course, that continued along. So this is the condition that the uh, truss tension drum was in when I saw it on eBay. And my first thought was, what in the name, what is that? What's happening? But I was able to see past it and say, if I'm able to resurrect this thing, it's going to be a celebrity. I just felt it, you know, with, with these instruments and the history of them, there's a lot of love and passion and, and uh, mojo that's on these things, you know, and vibe. I mean, this drum is 131 years old. It's, it's just wonderful. And it's still, luckily, in 131 years, not one single part is missing off of it including the chain, because this was a marching snare, 16 and so inches, that clipped on, and the leg rest, onto the leg rest. So to have every, including the heads, 
These heads are 100 years old. So it was just amazing. And when everyone else looked at this thing, they were like, number one, I don't know what it is. Number two, it's ugly, and it needs too much work. Now, this is a blow-up of what's known as the butt. And on a, any snare drum, you have the throw side, which operates the snares, and then you have the butt side that anchors the snares. Well, normally it is one piece screwed onto the shell, and the wires or two strings go into it. Well, here, being the industrial era, the industrial age, their idea was we're going to upgrade rope tension drums. So this is an industrial, if you see it now, it's an industrial version with metal and over-engineered trinkets. Instead of coming up potentially with maybe a better design, they chose to go this way. So in their minds, this butt has four J-hooks, four fasteners, the anchor box, a screw, a washer, a spacer, another washer, and a nut. There's 14 parts just to the butt alone. This entire drum has 124 parts to it. Madness. And I only know that because I completely disassembled this thing. This is the metal bands, the original condition of the metal bands, and then it restored. And uh, I'll just kind of give you a little secret on this, instead of going and meddling and polishing and cleaning, when I disassembled it, all I did was look at the back of the band that for a hundred years was on the inside, and it looked basically like that, and I just flipped them over. <laughs> kind of cheated a little, but listen, with 124 other parts, you got to take it where you can get it. Uh, so, uh, another interesting thing about this drum is drums most of have what's known as reinforcement rings, which are on the edges of the drum that are usually made of maple that keep the thinner shell in round. They reinforce the shell. Well, this one, in order to anchor all the parts, the anchor points to support the wires, that is a solid rock maple wood exterior reinforcement ring additionally. And when this all comes apart, you can just tap this when you take all the screws out and that ring just comes right off. So it was buried by all the gunk. This is all the hardware, what it looked like when it was on the drum with over a hundred years of God knows what all over it. And then with several days on a grinder and Lord, I think I lost more skin than I actually got more uh, chrome there. So here's a before and during and after of uh, what it takes. I also then... Okay, sure. Sure. The wire is one continuous wire that goes all the way around and clips into these receiving blocks. They're not, they don't crisscross this way, it's this top wire and then the bottom wire. So again, when you're looking at it, you've got the trunnion hook, the rod, this receiver block, and then the wire, and then each one of these screws is a screw with a washer, a spacer, another washer, a screw, and a nut on the inside. It's madness. So that's what the wires look like. Since I had never taken one of these apart before, there's the center hook, there it is, finely cleaned. And again, from this era, the surface that they put on the drum was known as shellac, where now it's like varnish and polyurethane and such. Shellac is basically bulletproof. It's so hard to get off. It, you can't just use citrus strip and just strip it. It's, boy. Learn by doing with this. There it is in the finished state, and then I touched to build up the design of it, and there's the beauty all finished. There's before, there's present day. And there's, look at that, all that beautiful butt there. <laughs> and that's, you, you know, yours truly at a, at a drum show. That's the way it would have looked being played and performed. Guys marching down the street with it in parade. 
This is Jim Catalano, who just retired several, uh, 2019 uh, after doing 39 years at Ludwig Drum Company. If you go to any Ludwig book, Rob, Rob Cook's book about Ludwig, Jim Catalano was a major force. He started working there in 1983. He loved the drum and wanted to have a, a picture of it. This is an example of a gentleman who lives in England. His name is Sticky Wicket, and he uh, is a 20s, 30s, 40s drum enthusiast, has a beautiful collection, plays, periods, really studied it. This is his drum, which is bird's eye maple, and all the uh, surrounding bits, the trunnion hooks and blocks, are in brass. Um, I certainly contacted him and tried to own that drum, but not quite yet. He's not ready to let it go. So uh, we will carry on. All right, let's see how this is, this is going to work. And we will get into all right, pretty painless. Uh, this, before I get into the World War II, there was only one other company in Western Pennsylvania, oddly enough. These trust, trust tension drums were only made by two companies. They were both in Philadelphia. This is the George Van Sant version. And as you can see, the wires are just a little slightly different, and the tuning screw is here in the middle. Now, this is, if you could see there, when it'll be cleaned, I'm not going to do a total restoration like I did on that one. I'll leave this to be a little more relic, but again, this has got this, the type of hook to hook on, and these heads are over 100 years old, and these cord wires are animal gut. And the heads from that period through into uh, after the war when plastic became popular and Remo made plastic heads available, it was all calf and goat skin and animal skin, pig skin, etc. So this then moving forward into the 1900s is an example and this drum is a Fred Gretsch drum, but however if you were to see a duplex or a Ditson, they look exactly like this. And again, it was manufacturing and then distribution. And you can see that back in the day, drum companies also were banjos and drums. So once you have the idea of a banjo and makeup in your mind, you can see how much it resembles a banjo. And in fact, these hooks on the hoops are actually banjo shoes, or what they're called, they're banjo parts, with all of these lugs on it back in the day. The sizes also were maybe 16, 15, and a what have you, because the heads weren't manufactured in a factory, they were handmade, the collars, etc. so they would make them to fit the specific drum. There's your 1900s. This one then also is another example, which is known as the thumb screw tuning. So instead of using a key, and it makes it much easier, you literally just tighten it. Again, the same banjo situation, but utilizing the banjo shoes in the center, where the rods screw into the hooks. So it just makes it one piece, and then you tune it by turning the thumb screws on the bottom. What's unique about this drum, this is a York and Sons out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Here is the throw side, which is unusual because it's reversed, because to tighten it, you literally have to go the opposite direction, and it's pulling the snare cords up as opposed to tuning it from the top. And the butt itself is simply just a patch of leather right here. That again, there's the animal skin cords and gut cords, snare wires, and the drums of this era, they really had a unique sound because of the, <laughs> oh darn it, I have to get my drumsticks, I'm sorry. They uh, have a quite unique sound, very throaty, very open because of the animal skin and the shell makeup. Also what's unique about this drum is it is made of quarter sawn oak, this beautiful the beautiful grain work on this is quarter sawn oak, which is, is very unusual, and the highly polished chrome lugs and hardware. So 
it's got a beautiful sound that is very responsive to tuning. Or even it's looser. And it's amazingly responsive by just turning a couple of uh, these tuning keys. So with that, I will, uh, the 20s and 30s era, Peter's drums here are gorgeous examples of the instruments of the 20s and 30s utilizing this little China Tom wood blocks because it was the vaudeville silent movie era. So there was a lot more sounds going on, replicating, uh, like at the end of my solo when I did the natural nature sounds. These guys had an amazing array of sound effects of whistles, horns, train cap guns, everything with a silent movie going on. Just think of, you know, Harold Lloyd and, you know, the train, they're chasing, they're running, and all this. They would have to see what was going on in the movie and replicate these sounds, uh, very theatrical. And um, you can see that that's the way it was uh, set up then until they got into the 30s. Oh, and then, of course, the gorgeous painted heads. I mean, that this was the 30s, you know, into the early 40s was the deco era prior to the war. So deco uh, was very fluid and lines and just really, really put their efforts into the visual aspect of the instruments. The light on the inside was twofold because of the animal skin. It was very susceptible to humidity. And when they get really humid, it absorbs the moisture and gets really flabby and or when it gets very dry, they then go the opposite direction. And a lot of times they'll warp and the heads will just split and break. So the lights on the inside were designed to backlight the picture or the painting and also keep warm air inside the drum to allow it to not be susceptible to the humidity. Gene Krupa in the 30s then with his playing style, not only did he just take the drum set and put it in front of the band, which the drummer was always in the back, made it the, a primary visual force and a solo instrument, a band leader situation. He also was the person that was responsible for getting away from tack bottom heads, which I have uh, pictures of, and he said, why don't we have heads tunable on both sides, which they were like, oh, okay. So early Slingerland drums in the early, early 40s had two snare drum lugs on it because they didn't have single tom lugs at that point. So not only is Gene Krupa responsible for changing the entire style of music at that period, but he actually was a, a major contributor on how drum sets are designed still today. So it's quite amazing. This is the War Production Board WPB logo that once, of course, we were involved in the Second World War. The War Production Board was in charge of every manufacturer of many, many things that went towards the war effort. And this was completely involved with drum manufacturers. They, were, they would go in and say, here's what you're going to do, here's what you're not going to do. Uh, the L37 stands for the governmental ruling that only 10% of each instrument could be made of metal. 10%. Some companies like Rogers, uh, there are no Rogers World War II drums because they went into the Rogers company and said, yeah, you guys are going to make gauges and altimeters for fighter airplanes. Uh, we'll set you up with the tooling. You'll have to train and completely rework yourself, just like what the United States did. Every single person in the United States was somehow involved in going, putting forth towards the war effort whether you are at home collecting cans, tires, war bonds, or of course being the actual soldiers that were on the front. It was a super collected effort to put forth to keep that going, which was just wonderful. We, uh, unfortunately, we certainly don't need that crisis again, but we certainly nowadays and of course, this is my opinion, you guys, is we need, we need more of that unity 
in the country. We need more of that instead of people at each other and causing harm and such. We are lockstep, arm in arm, together, regardless of race, color, creed, etc., moving forward as a country. That's what, that's what makes it stronger. And from that crisis was born these amazing looking instruments, utilizing the only material involved at that time, which was wood. There was actually a USS drum submarine, and that is the logo, which I just love that logo to death. And uh, you may not be able to see it, but on the bottom, if you look at the artwork, you've seen that artwork before. Can anybody, you know, give me an idea of identifying that artwork, the style of it? Okay, at the bottom of it, it says Walt Disney Company. They actually hired the uh, artists from Walt Disney. And if you see it now, you can see a little bit of uh, familiarity to it. This was the uh, 228 submarine, the USS Drum. This was their logo. There was also a Fort Drum. And Fort Drum was just a crazy giant hunk of concrete in the middle of the, the Philippines in an area that it looked like a ship, but was designed just to be there, a solid base to ward off any enemies coming in. That was Fort Drum, which I uh, thought was uh, you know, quite interesting. So here's an example of several of World War II drums utilizing wood, of which a lot that I have here today. This was, not was, this is, the manufacturer uh, Leedy Drum Company, which um, I'll backtrack a little bit. And in 1929, Ludwig and Leedy were purchased by CG Con. CG Con is an instrument company, wind instrument company. And they purchased Ludwig and Leedy. And Leedy was either on one floor and Ludwig on the other, or side to side. And they do have some similarities. Ludwig himself, worked at the factory, and what was happening is he was losing control on design suggestion and where he wanted it to go because it was no longer his company. So he then said, okay, I've had it, and I'm going to, I'm going to branch off and do my uh, own thing. This is an example. Let me shoot ahead a little bit. Here's some more examples as well. This drum here is a Ludwig drum, but however, Ludwig did not make this. C.G. Kahn made it in the designers. So at this point, Ludwig and Leedy are C.G. Kahn, and when Ludwig tried to come out with his own drums again in 1937, he had a badge on it that said W.M. period, F. period Ludwig, and C.G. Kahn was like, listen, you know, when we bought the company, we own your last name. You can't even use your last name anymore. So in order to get around that, he created WFL. And there was always confusion there of who was first or second. There was no first and second. There was Ludwig, Ludwig, CG Con, and WFL at the same time, even though WFL was really Ludwig. So over on the right at the top is an example of the Ludwig victory. And if you look at the bottom of those toms, you see that there are like little round, look like nail heads. They are actually tack bottom heads. So what they would do is, on the bottom of the drum, instead of having, as I told you before, Gene Krupa, they would literally spread the skin around and with tacks, they would tack it in and it was not tunable. And sometimes they would paint the bottom to try to prevent uh, the humidity from coming in and out. But what would happen then with that is they would stifle the drum. And if it was thick pigskin, it, it was just difficult at times to get them to sound good. Um, in the center, uh, let's not do that. The, the black diamond pearl, which is this one, is Slingerland's version. This is the most popular one today. And this is the one that's kind of the household word. When you say rolling bomb, I mean, uh, excuse me, when you say World War II drums, people go, oh, yeah, yeah, rolling bomber, rolling bomber. Even though this is a rolling bomber. So Slingerland's version, because Slingerland had the money, these are before you weren't able to have them anymore. These are actual genuine rosewood, 
which is beautiful. Maple hoops. The shell itself is made up of maple. And they even went as far as making the throw mechanism and the butt all of rosewood, being rosewood. Where some of the other companies didn't go that far. Again, I'll come back to the Ludwig one. Here is they chose to have thick rock maple hoops curved over which these are my favorite hoops, they, they sound the best. The drums that I did the solo on, those drums are made in 1942, and I revamped and upgraded those, and I, I have some pictures of it too. Uh, they are war, World War II drums, this is the matching snare to it. And uh, the general idea is that people are like, eh, you can't play these drums, they're not playable. Well, I beg to differ. That's one of the best sounding drum sets that I own. And it's not like I was, you know, just doing brush work. I mean, I was kind of hammering those things. And the several weeks prior to this concert, practicing every day, every day, and they just respond unbelievably. They look beautiful and they just sound amazing and are quite new unique. This finish is known as a Duco finish. It's a painted uh, finish. There's some more loveliness going on. Some more loveliness. <laughs> now, that the drums that I had showed you prior, off onto the side, which was this snare drum, that's what they look like when I bought them. Somebody along the line in their lives decided that they would look better if they were painted that color green. So what was good for me is that a majority of people look at World War II stuff, they're like, mm, nah, not interested, and especially if it looks like that. I had to completely disassemble the whole thing and refinish it, and I decided to go with a blended lighter color so it's not the typical dark-looking wood of the era. And again, these drums just re respond oh so beautifully. And you can see a close-up of the tack heads on the bottom. What I did with those drums is I made them double side tune. I completely reworked and upgraded them so you can tune them on both sides, which makes them uh, one of a kind. There it is again. Ugh, memories. Now, what's quite unique about this kit is the gentleman who bought them new and owned them decided to date it and sign his name and put his address. When I found out on the inside, it was like, man, you know, when you can get any kind of providence or backstory on these instruments, it's, it's just amazing to see what, where their journey has gone. And then the next owner decided to do the same thing when he saw that. So he put his name in pencil, <coughs> excuse me, and also put his address, which is just unique. It really gives you a little insight. There's the drums to the left that are finished, and that cat head was uh, originally a part of it that I just restored and upgraded as well. I have no information about that. Maybe the band was called the Howlin' Cats or the Jazz Cats or something. So uh, again, another unique uh, situation there. Now, these drums are WFL first version, and most people uh, I have no idea what I mean when I say first version. There was several unique things going on with this drum kit. Here is an example of it. Let's see, did I bring the... Right, I can... This drum kit, yes. Ludwig and Cecil Stroop were combined together in a company. Cecil Stroop did uh, instruments in the 30s called Master Touch, and he had an incredible engineering mechanical mind, but not very acoustical. So he developed snare drums that you could tune the whole drum by just turning two wing screws, which was beautiful, but when you looked at it, in order to it to work, there was this massive metal aluminum that was in the drum with these rods going all over. And, uh, you know, the typical uh, acoustic properties of a drum is when you strike it on the top, the sound waves and vibrations go straight down, strike the bottom head, it bounces it back up, and that's how a drum works. Well, when you've got a mass of metal in the middle of it, you hit it, the sound wave hits that and starts flying all over the place, and it's, it's just an awful sound. Ludwig, as 
WFL, took the war effort with Cecil Stroop and said, let's do something different. Let's put this whole thing on its ear. And what they came up with was this design. A conventional drum design is you have a lug and anchor point, and then the tension rod goes into the anchor point. What we have here is these are the anchor points, and the head and the hoop are affixed to this anchor point. On the inside of it, as you can see by that technical drawing, is bows of wood where the rod goes through into the center. When you would tighten that, the bows of wood would open up like this. Usually the bearing edge ring is affixed to the shell. These were floating rings that the uh, hoops seek pushed up and down on it to tune the drum. And if you think about it, it's amazingly unique idea. There are the bows of wood, there's the floating ring at the top, and you can see the tension screws coming through the side of the body like this. They were like, yes, they put this thing out. They got a big contract with the army and just started pumping this stuff out. Well, because it's war period, war time, everybody's you know, trying to do the best they can do. There was a serious major flaw in the design and execution of this. The tension rods were not threaded all the way up. They were only threaded three quarters of the way. So what would happen is dealing with um, calfskin heads, you know, predominantly drummers are not engineers. You know, they get it out, do, 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 fine. We play it, we march on the street. You tighten it, tighten it, and because of the calfskin reacting to the weather, they would tighten this thing on the side, this rod here. The rod would go all the way to the end of the threads. Now in the center, you see those big cup washers where the rod's coming through. That threaded piece is just press welded, press welded. What would happen is these guys would get to the end and they'd think, what, what's this? And they would force it and snap that press weld. Now the rod just spins. The entire drum is no longer tunable. The entire drum was no longer tunable. Well, after they cashed a check from the army, these drums started coming back, coming back. Again, Cecil Stroop, engineering mind, not acoustics. This drum as a parade drum could not compete with the other parade drums like you had seen here played earlier. Those drums are big, they're throaty, they're loud. This thing with all of this wood and all this uh, acoustical interruptions just couldn't sonically compete with the other drums as well. Well, this was a serious problem that almost put Ludwig as WFL out of the drum business. So he had to, in the middle of the war, I mean, everybody else is dealing with the war in their own uh, retooling and such. WFL now has to stop production of what he was doing on this great idea and completely revamp again within a major revamping. And his idea was, just for the sake of staying afloat, this is the WFL second version, which is almost identical to the Slingerland Rolling Bomber. He went back to conventional lugs, although these are walnut, walnut, the throw and the butt, calfskin head, very similar hoop design as Slingerland. Ludwig and Slingerland were back and forth in court over patent infringements for forever, for ages, they were constantly battling each other. He had to do this just to absolutely stay afloat. This is what the lugs look like uh, when they're off the drum. When I got them, they were all uh, painted for a flat black. Yeah, good idea. That's what they look like stripped. Yes, I had to hand strip each one, kind of giving you a little insight into my mind and my psyche. This, however, is the result. So, you know, you put in the effort, you look at it, and when you can see past the negative, you then get this amazing looking instrument that in itself, again, born from crisis, is just art. It's simply just art. 
although it was a colossal failure. These are the wood parts. I have a whole kit for that that I had to recreate. And this is that entire kit with the hardware set up. So they had those crooked kind of uh, clamps on them with just wood dowels, just wood dowel going from the clamp on the bottom with another dowel in it. And they were, they held the cymbals. They, they also made foot pedals, hi-hat stands, and snare drum stands all out of wood, which were just junk. I mean, you know, they lasted a little bit. I mean, they're wood. They're not designed, but they did the best that they could. At least, you know, gave it the old college try to make the effort. There is the wood pedal. I've, uh, I have a couple of these. That's the before. This piece of wood on the bottom is actually a muffler. It's an external muffler that, like this. This is a later version of an external muffler. That was basically, well, the disc is missing. It was just a disc of wood and this little bit that just went on the front. And of course, this stuff just broke left and right like crazy. And guys just went back to using uh, metal stuff. Oops. There we go. There's the drum finish that I showed you this one. That one was the one that was all flat black and, and just unhappy. There's the stand and the pedal, completely refinished as well. So, I mean, you can see just these little dainty dowels of wood that were just, it was just crazy. But listen, you know, it's wartime, man. We got to do what we got to do. So what I did also is uh, with Boom Drums, my uh, drum company, if you will, is in, in because of my passion for the World War II era, I decided to go old school, new school and upgrade World War II era drums. So these are actual World War II era drums, and they are refinished, covered with what's known as African Limba veneer. The hoops are new, etc., but then refinished all the lugs and rods. That snare drum is this beauty right here, and the only difference is, is that this drum is composed of all brand new parts. These are all new parts that I sought out and designed it to make it look like it would fit in with the drums from the 40s. And the result is just stunning. I mean, the wood, you could see the grain just throws the light beautifully. So, I mean, they're, and they are, again, they're quite sound differently, but they are quite functional. Sensitive, loud. These drums are definitely, definitely playable. There is the full kit, 26 inch bass, 11 inch tom. Back in the days then, they had odd, inch, odd size toms, 11, 13, until they switched over to make them even sizes. 26 bass and a 14, and then there's that snare drum. And these things sound amazing. You should hear that bass drum, Pete. It's just. Kaboom. It's amazing. It's wonderful. This is a kit, a replica kit made by a friend of mine, um, Will Tillman. Beautiful example. Rosewood lugs, maple hoops. He, he, he's a craftsman at craftsman. That's an idea of what the tack head looks like. It would go into that channel and then they would tack it with either a metal band uh, and then that's just the animal skin on the bottom. This is an example of the Leedy Company. They were uh, much more celebratory of the Art Deco period and the sweeping lines of the lugs. That's a parade drum. Um, that was a client restoration I did. That entire thing was just painted mustard yellow. <laughs> mustard yellow. And the guy showed it to me and said, hey, you know, can you fix this? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> can you pay it? And he did. And look at the example. That's all mahogany. Uh, and the hoops usually are maple, but I refinished them to match the drum and gorgeous. And that thing just sounded, sounded wonderful. There's another little hoop shot of it. And the hoops, you know, they, they had their own slight little different shape. They had this nice little build out here on it. Even though they were made in the same company as Ludwig in the same building, they still gave you the impression that they were two different companies, even though they were still under the CG Con umbrella. This is what 
drum uh, will look like prior. This is a kit that I'm working on, and it's called Orphans. You gather period instruments. All of the boom drum stuff that I do, including this kit, those are 98% original parts. Very few new parts when needed as necessity. So as you can see, you just gather what you can gather and put some time and effort and design into it, and they then end up with your efforts looking something like this. Very happy, very functional instrument. Resurrecting them so they can go on for another 80 so years. Those are a close up of the rosewood lugs on an exotic veneer. That veneer is gonna go on the drums that you had just seen. This is that kit up close and the others in the back. That's uh, if you go see me at a, a drum show. This is of the Chicago drum show two years ago. That's kind of where my booth is and I invite people in to do exactly you know, what I'm doing now because the majority of the people really have no idea about the World War II era. This is a Slingerland rolling bomber pre, after cleaning, restoration, that's what they come to me. You know, they're in basements and attics and sheds and God knows what for 72 years, and they're still viable. They're just forgotten, neglected, or unhappy. Well, we try to then make them happy again and make them functional, functional instruments. Now, the story with this, that logo that I showed you earlier that came to me on that drum, Ludwig this year came out, as they do maybe every three, four years, they, they came out with a couple of new design lines of drums. The design is a flat back, flat black finish with wood hoops like this with clips reminiscent of the 40s. The name of the drum is called the Black Cat. There's a picture of them. And you can see what you've seen, you can see the resemblance, the wood hoops, the black finish. Now in the 70s, they had a finish called Black Panther in the 70s. And it was a matte covering that just went over the drums. So they're doing like a double throwback here. And Ludwig contacted me and they said, you know, we tried to go after all these different logos and the only one that really kept coming up of any interest was the one that's on your vintage drum. And they said, we would like to somehow get your permission to use that logo, you know, basically what it's, what's it gonna cost? And I said, well, I honestly, I don't, I have no ownership. I have no ownership to that painting. I didn't paint it, I didn't design it. I just redesigned it, worked it, and upgraded it. I own the drum. I said, so, God forbid if I were to get paid for this and the names that I showed you earlier, somebody's grandson happens to get in touch and say, my aunt so-and-so put that on there, and, which would never probably happen, but let's stay above board, shall we, right? So I said to them, uh, yes, I would be honored. They said, well, because of that then, here it is, our legacy mahogany, there's your logo, the best we can do is one of the first 50 snare drums that we make in production, we will give to you for your efforts for allowing us to do it. I, man, I was floored. And I said, well, could you please accompany it with a certificate of authenticity so it's not just, yeah, I could buy this off a shelf, which they're available now. It's got some prominence and backstory to it. So after doing all this craziness for a while, some of it actually kind of pays off nicely, and it's uh, something I'm quite proud of. There is those drums redone, and if you see the bottoms, you can see the hoops that are on the bottom, the hoop on the front. All of these drums were single side tuned. That's the original finish, which is this drum here, the Duco painted finish. That's the original uh, painted finish. There's some more World War II loveliness. There is that kit that you had seen expanded that matches this with the cymbal stand tops, the woods, and a matching wood block. All the wood matching and looking lovely. There is that Limba kit that just is smoking. 
And what this is, interesting thing about this, this was Gene Krupa's front logo head. Gene Krupa never played Rolling Bombers, ever. He didn't play them. He was, you know, for the war effort, but was like, no, I'm not playing that, man. I'm, I'm sticking with what I have. So what they talked him into, well, they had to talk him into it, is let's go USA, keep them flying. Keep them flying was one of the major, major um, sayings of the time. Angels on our shoulders were the flying uh, cats. Keep them flying. Whenever they would say, hey, keep them flying, you know, but get the war bond in, we got to keep them flying. And again, a little bit of uh, insight is this was an original head that is now uh, in a museum. And in order for Gene to go out and do some stuff, if he had to play a gig with the big band that was for the war effort, they actually created a cardboard placard that he would just put on the front of his drum, you know, and he's representing the war era and the war effort. And then the next night when they were going to somewhere else and playing a big dance show, he would just take the placard off. And of course, wow, well, I guess I like that shirt, huh? Anybody want to take a picture of that? You, you want to take a picture of that? Is that? <laughs> okay. Now, also, I am the organizer and the um, uh, creator, not creator, uh, of the Delaware Drum Show down in Delaware. It's every February. Of course, due to our present situation with COVID, it has been postponed like many other things have been done. So it is quite an amazing show that was, went on for a couple, about 18 years. Joe Gilday, he gave it up, moved down to Florida. It was a three-year break, and I then took the show over, and it has grown to become the second largest drum show in the United States. Uh, very proud and happy that so, uh, up to 40 vendors from all across, I mean, New England, New York, Western Pennsylvania, North, South Carolina, vintage, new, and custom. There's an amazing array of custom drum builders that are out there. And they're not drum assemblers. They don't buy the parts and put them together. They make the shells. They go get flat pieces of wood and do the woodworking uh, and all the creativity with it, which is, which is amazing. All right. How are we doing on time here, Pete? We good? Now, let's see. Okay. Let's move on to some of barn fresh. Barn fresh is a term that hot rod guys use, car guys, antique people. Barn fresh means exactly that. Uh, American pickers, if you will, right? A majority of the stuff they get is barn fresh. I mean, it's been in a barn and attic, a basement for decades. So considering you saw the condition of drums that I get and then bring them to restored beauty, I thought, man, maybe it'd be kind of cool if I were to do something in the opposite direction and get, <coughs> excuse me, get newer drums and replicate, replicate the funk and the mojo. So what we have here is, this is known as a barn, my barn fresh kit. Again, 98% original parts. Here's how it looked at the very beginning. It was a mahogany shell, straight mahogany shell, very similar to this. And I created this duco, the two color finish, by bleaching the center of the wood and then using a white pickling stain and then kind of using, actually using a drumstick, uh, a Jackson Pollock type of um, situation on just doing some splatter to make them look like they were in the attic for 35 years. This design here is my own little crazy design. This is a Leedy 40s hoop clamp connected to a 60s leg rest bracket, which if they offered at the time a suspension mount, this is what it would look like. I did just the bass drum first, had the idea, did it, brought it to the Chicago show. That's mahogany interior. Here it is in its various stages. That's the joys of cleaning hardware. It's lovely. You should all try it sometime. Okay, maybe not. This is an example of the front head on this bass drum. 
And all these heads, except for this one, are, are not calfskin. They are modern heads that I faux painted to make it look like calfskin to give it still that same barn fresh idea. There it is in its various stages. This back head uh, kind of gets people chuckling when they see it because that is in with this kit is old school. You would take material moleskin and just tape it onto the head before they had all these modern patches and such in order for muffling and to protect it. That drum head actually came that way. I did not create that. Uh, it came off of one of the very first drum sets I ever saw as a kid and was lucky enough to have the opportunity years and years later to acquire that drum set again. So as an homage to my fourth grade band buddy Gene, whose drums, dad's drums, then his they were, which now I lovingly own and have restored. Um, I pay homage to Gene and Augie by using that head on this kit, which ties into the whole Barn Fresh situation. That's what the Tom Tom, this one, that's what it looked like originally. Mahogany shell with all metal hoops and hardware. Here it is in various forms. There's the hoops, ugly green, that I just gathered all these parts. There it is in mid work. There's a Jackson Pollock. He would have been proud. Yes, I live alone. That is my shower with the hoops drying on a mic stand. Here they are again. This again is, is yes, hardware. Lovely. There is up close of my crazy creation, and there's the snare drum with the original hoop design that I did. And just recently, in fact, for this show and this performance, I was able to get together and take the next step and include the silver glitter inlays that's here, but aged it back so it looks like, again, it's from the 40s, which is an upgrade from the Jackson Pollock situation there. That again. There she is with the glitter glory. That's an interior shot of the kit you're looking at right there. And I mean, come on. Come on, look at that. Drums by sunset. Doesn't get any better, guys. <laughs> Girls, look at that. <laughs> All right. We have one last one heading down the home stretch. You guys are awesome for letting me do this. And if there's any questions, anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Ludwig Victory Bob Kit, which is that kit over there. That's what they look like, folks. Those drums over there, this is what they look like before I got to them. You can see on the bottom of the 16, the tack head, the tack head, and the tack heads on the bottom. The finish, you can see it's 70-year-old painted finish. Barn fresh, right there, it's barn fresh. That's the matching snare drum. So what I had to do was I had to get strips of wood, soak them. It rained for like three days straight. I had the little strips of wood. I just threw them out on the back patio, let them just soak up the water, and then just literally clamp and glue bend them in and around to fill in that channel. There they are channeled. That's the interior, all maple interior. Then bodied over to smooth it. So yes, those finish over there, that's what they looked like to begin with. Two toms, there's the lugs going on to the bottom, now creating the bottom tunable side head. More, of course, prior to painting. The hoops, there's the finished hoops, there's before, after. There's the, you know, we're on our way. This is my buddy Mike in town that created a jig to drill out those. I had to dremel the interiors of those. Those are the lugs gathered from, again, orphan pieces and parts. You gather them, and then you continue to finish them until you have your final copy. There they are painted. Uh, it's a trick that I use as well. This is the collars, the head collars here. 
When you see drums, you always see a metal collar. Well, I do go to the next step and I paint them to match so it's seamless and your eye isn't uh, taken up by this. And if you look at those, all you see are the hoops and body. You don't see any of the heads. The black just blends in. Yeah, there it is, the finish, into the finished product. I also then added modern mounting system. This is the bass drum pedal mounting system on the bottom to make it sturdy and playable and reliable front legs, which some people would get bugged by putting modern stuff on vintage drums. But again, a majority of the people could care less about World War II drums. They're like, yeah, whatever. It's not going to affect the value, which in my mind, those things are much more valuable now than they would be in their natural collected state, which would be kind of sitting on a shelf, you know, looking dingy. Now they're viable instruments. So, if perhaps anyone here today and or watching this video later on have any questions, have any comments, I welcome comments, positive, negative. I welcome questions, any type of contact. You can contact me at my email address, joeyboom.comcast.net. joeyboom.com is my website. You can kind of look and see all of the uh, additional craziness that's there on my website. Facebook, Joe Meckler. Instagram, joeyboom1. That is my, uh, my boom drum logo, of course, representing that, having nothing to do with modern yay for the military. It's World War II. Please keep that in mind. Not pushing any other ideas. And, of course, DelawareDrum.com on the bottom. Uh, any of you enthusiasts, go to DelawareDrum.com. You'll see photos of the clinicians that we have, the type of show. It's, it's a blast, man. And if you are even remotely interested in drums, any kind of drums, accoutrements that go with it, cymbals, stands, etc., it's a wonderful day, uh, a celebration of percussion and drumming. That, of course, is my little kitty cat there. I managed to sneak one in, so. Does anyone at this point have any questions, any comments? Yes, sir. Well, it, it, it would depend because, of course, I'm doing client restorations in and around it as well, and then doing some of my own stuff. Sometimes it depends upon the severity of the restoration collecting the parts. Uh, like at times I'll do a restoration like this one. I did this one, it took two weeks, and a majority of the time was sun up to sundown. I mean, literally, you know, that's it. Especially if I'm preparing for a show. Some are a lot quicker than others. Uh, drum cats, a uh, drum, uh, like doing custom stuff like this. This was on and off for a couple of years to finally get to its, its uh, present state here. So I, I take on client stuff that seem to be very rare drums in the worst condition. I don't know, I just seems to be my thing and I get halfway through each restoration and I'm swearing and cussing going, what, you know, why am, I, why am I doing this? But then when it gets to the, uh, this is why, this is why. Any other questions from anyone? Thank you very much for getting into my world craziness here. I appreciate it very, very much. Ladies and